I thank God for the psalmists, Lennon and McCartney. Because very often, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm being very honest. I don't know how many times the words of that song have epitomized my prayer life. When I feel so hurt that I can't vocalize my pain, when I feel so failed, I can't accept the fact that Jesus actually loves me unconditionally. When I feel so lost, I can't even put words together to express how I feel. I've been serving Jesus now for 50 years, and I'm beginning to realize more and more and more without his ever-present help in the time of trouble, I would never make it. Without his grace and his love and his attention and his strength, somebody say amen in this house, I would never be here now. And I think the older I get, the, sim the, the more simplicity, the more, uh, not simple in the sense of, you know, but the more uncomplicated my relationship with Jesus is. My mind uh, over the years sometimes becomes so cluttered, my emotions so straight-jacketed because of all this stuff. Come on, it's about time to get back to actually believing the words of Jesus when he says, it's time to become like little children again. Amen. And the older I'm getting, the younger I'm getting. Yes. Ah. <laughs> See, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to help lost people find their way. And I, I don't know this morning, the reason why I'm, I'm preaching this message is because this cry, I just feel, this cry is coming up from many people this morning. And that song epitomizes, sometimes I, 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 sometimes I can get to a place where I feel even so destroyed, I can't even use scripture to express how I feel. How many of you know God will find a way to meet you, he will find a way to reach you in a way that only you can be reached? And sometimes it may not be through scripture. Sometimes it may not be through a worship song. You could be walking around the supermarket, devastated, wondering what to do. Say, God, help me. And you pick up a packet of green peas. And right there on the instruction, God can speak to you. Come on, somebody. Stop limiting God. And that song, really, the reason why I sung it, because, but because that, that the word help. My prayer life sometimes is this, thank you, help, and that's it. And I, I, I believe, I just feel this morning there's a cry, that's the cry going up for many people because you just feel lost. And I'm not just talking to people who are not believers, I'm talking to Christians, especially at this time when your faith has been challenged or something has happened, Put it like this, I, I remember sitting in the cinema watching a Star Trek movie. I love the Star Trek movies. And I'm into this, and the, the gist of the story was um, there was this massive energy cloud racing through the galaxies. And it, it was eating up planets, and it was eating up uh, uh, stuff, and it was angry, and it was frustrated, and it couldn't have its needs satisfied. So they sent for Captain Kirk and Spock, and they said, you've got to sort this out, of course. Now, this is not a true story, okay? Some of you were thinking, what? So, <laughs> so no, you've got to clarify it, because someone's writing this down. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to check that. Why wasn't this on CNN? Anyway, so, anyway... So, uh, so, 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 they, the, so, they, so, so the, the Enterprise crews, long story short, they got right into the center of the cloud, and they found that in the center of the cloud, there was a crater with a machine in the, in the middle of it, and the machine was the cause of all the frustration. So they walked down to the machine, and, uh, and they discovered it was a NASA probe that had been sent into the universe 
300 years before, but it had malfunctioned. So they wiped the dust off it, and there was a sign, if malfunctioned, press in the code. And the code was there. So Captain Kirk just pressed in the code. And do you know what happened? You see, the probe was trying to find its creator, but it had malfunctioned. And so all they had to do was punch in the code. And there are people in this service this morning, I know some of you may have been Christians for 30 years, but something has malfunctioned. There's a frustration, there's an anger, there's uh, what's going on, there's what's happening. Well, listen to me, God has sent this little hobbit from the Shire this morning to punch in the code. You see, many of you perhaps have been serving Jesus for a while, but you've malfunctioned, betrayal, failure, sin. I don't know what it is. A bad decision. A sin and a decision you never thought you would make, but you made it. And you, you're like this angry cloud. No, here's the code. 4316. The fourth gospel, the third chapter, and the 16th verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever allows him to punch in the code, come on, he really is the answer. He is the answer to that malfunction. And, and the reason I, I, you know, I think of, when I thought of that story, I thought of Peter Bless him, I love Peter, because he's made more mistakes than I have. <laughs> I love Peter because he's failed worse than I failed. Uh, and here's, here's, here's Peter. Um, I, I love this. Imagine this. Here they are in the upper room. Um, they're already confused, <laughs> the 12 of them. One of them's gone off on one, so, but he was part of the plan anyway. And, uh, and so the Bible says that they, they shared uh, bread and wine together at the Last Supper. So I'm picking it up from there. Jesus was about to take them through the Kidron Valley up to the Garden of Gethsemane where we know the story. So in Matthew chapter 26, it, it says this. Uh, and, and so they sang a hymn. Remember that because many commentators believe the hymn that they sang before they went out of the upper room was Psalm 136, where there are only 26 verses, but in every verse it says, and his love endures forever. Because, and they sang a hymn, because Peter would have to remember this in just a few moments. That's why Jesus sang the hymn. And they went out to the Mount of Olives, and on the way, Jesus told them, the team, he was about to encourage his team, tell them how wonderful they were, and he said, tonight, all of you <laughs> will desert me, for the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, but after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And I'm thinking already, Jesus is setting them up for, for them to help them with the upcoming failure that he knew was about to happen. He'd already sung a hymn declaring that his love would never fail. And now he says, I'm gonna go ahead of you. And I love this. In spite of your upcoming disloyalty, guys, in spite of your upcoming hypocrisy, I'm still going to lead you, I'm still going to love you, and I'm still going ahead of you. Somebody say amen right here. This is when Peter should have shut his mouth. But Peter declared he was very offended. Jesus, are you serious? I am Peter the rock. Come on. The revelation receiver, you said it. But Peter declared, even if everyone deserts you, I will never desert you. Freedom! 
And Jesus looked at him, I'm thinking tongue-in-cheek, like, Peter, I tell you the truth, bro. This night, this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even knew me. Peter, now is the time to humbly, but not Peter, but Peter (laughs) insisted. (laughs) Come on, you plonker, shut it. Jesus, even if I have to die, I will never deny you. And the other guys are catching up now. They didn't want to be embarrassed. And so say all of us. Hey. <laughs> Come on, hey. They were all, they, that's what they were like. And we laugh at the disciples, and some of us may stand in judgment. How could you do that? Hey, come on. We, and so have we, so have we prided ourselves in our faithfulness to Jesus. (laughs) That's why we all need a personal revelation of the grace of God because there is coming a time when the rooster will crow for you. The grace of God is not given to make life perfect, but to perfect us when it isn't. The grace of God is not given so that life works out according to our plans, but to sustain us when they don't. The grace of God is not given to ensure that all our relationships work out. But instead, the grace of God is available to heal your broken heart when they're destroyed. Someone says, well, relationships are like a walk in the park. Yeah, Jurassic Park. Anyway, (laughs) so just thought I'd share that. The, the, The grace of God is not experienced when the potter places the pot in the window and say, hey, look what I've just made. Now, the grace of God is displayed when the pot is marred in the potter's hands, but he keeps on molding and he keeps on working. He doesn't throw you off the wheel of destiny, but he takes that marred clump of clay and he just creates something that he knew that he designed. The grace of God works best when our dreams of best are destroyed. That family member died even after... Faith confession was declared. Your co-worker betrayed you even after years of invested mentoring. Your spouse left you. You lost your job. Your reputation was slandered and your friends believed it. Am I talking about this is what life sometimes turns out to be? But like Peter, the worst of all, is the discovery of the traitor hiding in your heart you never realized was there. What do you do when the rooster crows for you and the traitor is exposed? Let's pick it up from Luke 22. We all knew what happened to Peter. And then look at this. Luke twenty two fifty five, 55, and the guards lit the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. Not only had he denied knowing his Savior, but now he was sitting, fellowshipping with the very people that had scourged him, scourged him and were about to crucify him. And a servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. When a kid starts staring at you, you've got a problem. (laughs) You all know the story about my granddaughter who made me 30 by throwing magic dust all over me. Well, I'm driving her to school the other day and she's staring at me. I said, Eva, why are you staring at me? She says, Bamper, I think it's wearing off. And she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers, and Peter denied it. After a while, someone else looked 
unto him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I am not. And in one translation, it says he said it with a vow. In other words, on my mother's life, I'm telling you I don't know him. About an hour later, someone else insisted this must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Bible says at that moment the Lord turned, didn't say a word, turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flash through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow, you will deny me three times. And this is the, this, these next few words encapsulate where some of you are right now. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. How could you, Peter? Weeping bitterly. Bitterly. This is not just shedding tears of remorse. This is not just, oh well, I made a mistake, you know, God will cover it. This is weeping bitterly. It's inconsolable grief. It's shame with no hope of release. It's a guilty heart awaiting judgment. These were not tears that says, well, shouldn't have done that. I'll try better next time. These were tears that shouted, there is no next time for you. But probably the worst feeling of all was the belief that Jesus had rejected him. Watch, because Peter surrendered against his conviction. What sin have you committed against your conviction you feel disqualified from forgiveness? What decision have you made against your conviction that's convinced you God's done with you? Who have you betrayed? Who have you hurt? Against your conviction that has caused you to believe that even God can't look at you in love. And that is where some of you are right now. I've been there. Because sometimes Jesus will al allow us to go there because he wants us to understand and have a revelation of something that will change our lives forever. Like Peter, you made a declaration of loyalty, then discovered the traitor lurking in your heart, and now you're devastated because the rooster has crowed for you, watch, and you don't know what to do. Peter surrendered against his conviction and found a place to weep. The genuine love you thought you had for Jesus in reality because you surrendered against your conviction morally, relationally, biblically, it simply revealed how shallow and imperfect your love really is for him. Your love for him was not what you thought it was. It's a devastating discovery. And you too, like Peter, have experienced the look. And you don't know what you have to do to get back to that place of acceptance. Are you still with me this morning here? I've had to say all that to locate where you are. I've had to say all that to give us a dose of reality of exactly something that is the potential within all of us. And the rooster has crowed for people in this room. And you, you, like Peter, you have found a place to weep. You're inconsolable. And because you've sat under legalistic, religious teaching, you have to judge yourself now the way you've judged others. 
And you don't know where to go. And you don't know what to do. You, 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 in some pathetic way, there is a love for Jesus, but you don't know how to get reconnected. And Peter was in this position. Well, you've malfunctioned. You lost. This is all going on. You need this. How do you get this? Well, this is what you have to do to get back to where you were. Are you ready for this? I want you to write these things down because this is what you have to do when the rooster crows for you. Are you ready for this? Sure it is. Nothing. <laughs> Come on, somebody, you better say amen right here. Nothing! Because Jesus has already gone ahead of you to plan your restoration, to plan your recommission. Peter's failure and unfaithfulness was not a surprise to Jesus. In fact, he'd already made provision for it. <clears throat> and I declare to you, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've surrendered against your conviction. Jesus has already gone ahead of you. He's known about it. And before you came in here, like he sat on the beach, cooking breakfast for this man who thought it was over, Jesus was sitting on this stage, waiting for you, your little tinker, waiting for you to come here. And he says, welcome to breakfast. It's time to move on. It's time to start to fulfill what I started in your life. Somebody better get excited right here. Man, I'm preaching myself happy. <clears throat> He's always been ahead of your failure. Why do you think he sang the hymn? Peter... You're going to discover it's not about your love for me. But it's about my unconditional love for you on a daily basis. Peter, it's not about your grip on me. It's about my grip on you. It's not about your faithfulness towards me. You have to learn this. And the only way you're going to learn is, learn it, I'm going to allow you to fail. I'm going to allow you. And you know the story. Watch this. So they're sitting on the beach. And, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? <laughs> My God. Jesus, Jesus actually said, do you agape me, Peter? Now, before the denial, he would have said, I will die for you. Sounded like Reinhard Bonker then, didn't I? <laughs> I will die for you. <coughs> Or before the, before the failure, he would have said, I agape you. That Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you agape me? Do you know what Peter's answer was? I filio you. I, in a Bevan translation, I love you the best way I can. He asked him three times. And then the third time, Peter was really freaking out. Jesus, you know would you press it? You know, I own up. He said, that's all I wanted to know. Now go feed my sheep. Come on. Now you know it's not about your love for me. It's about my love for you. And when they, <clears throat> I'm coming to a close. And when they, see the look. See, some of you have experienced the look. But Peter didn't realize it was not a look of condemnation. It was a look of, I got this. Peter, I got this. And he looks at you. Those of you that are weeping bitterly, those of you that are beating yourself up, for those of you the rooster has crowed for you and just exposed the shallowness of what you thought was so wonderful. And Jesus looks at you this morning and he says, In those days when they scourged a criminal, they would, the scourger would stand in front of the victim because many of the criminals would die at the scourging post and they were to die by law, by crucifixion. So the scourger, who was a master at his trade, 
If he saw the light of life leaving someone's eyes, he'd back off. In the book of Luke, they did something strange when they scourged Jesus. They blindfolded him. Why would you do that? Do you know what I believe? As that scourger looked into the eyes of Jesus, as he looked at Jesus with all the hate and vehemence, he couldn't stand the gaze of compassion that looked back at him. Cover those eyes. And Jesus turned and looked at Peter, and I believe he wished he had a blindfold then, but no, no, no. No, Jesus says, Peter, I got this. Restoration is not about the sacrifice we make. That's why the devil has whole sections of the body of Christ repenting of sins of their forefathers and the sins and the repent. This is not the time for the church to repent. It's time for the church to receive. Christianity, restoration is not about the sacrifice we make. It's about the sacrifice we trust. True repentance finds its effectiveness in trusting his sacrifice, not yours. Come on, somebody say amen. I'm nearly through. I'm nearly through. I'm going to finish with this. I shared this some years ago here. But I, I, this morning, I just felt the Lord say, you need to share this again. I was sitting, I was sitting, <clears throat> I was sitting in a, a Tuesday night prayer meeting in our church. And one of our young men was preaching on this verse, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Verse 20. Oh, I should have given you verse 20. Well, let me finish verse 20. It says, Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. And I noticed there's two words. I thought there was one word, but there's two words in that verse that have nautical implications. Nautical means something to do with the sea, okay? Just saying. So, they have no, the first one is anchor. So, this hope we have, not we are hoping to have, talking about our salvation, this hope we have as an anchor to the soul, which has gone in the very presence of God. So, so the anchor, the, 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 the security of our salvation is behind the veil. And then the other word that's used is forerunner. Now, I checked out that a forerunner is also a nautical term. When a ship used to come into a harbor in those days, and the ship couldn't negotiate the harbor because it was too small, there was a guy on the ship called the forerunner. His job was to take the anchor, put it in a small boat, and row ashore and anchor the ship on dry ground, then slowly winch the ship in. Jesus has not only anchored our salvation in the very presence of God, but he is our forerunner. He is slowly winching you in day by day until one day you'll see him face to face. When I was, when I was that, when I was, watch this. So God showed me this, right? So let me show you. Let me introduce you to Jesus here. Um, he's from South Africa. You didn't know that. This is Werner. This is what I saw, okay? This is what I saw. So, okay. So Jesus came into the world. That's all right, man. Good. Thank you, Werner. So Jesus came into the world, okay? He lived, died, resurrected, and ascended. Can you take the full length of it? Yeah, that's it. Brilliant. And he said this. So then he went back to heaven, our forerunner, anchored your salvation. And he says, anybody that believes this will live forever. 
Now, I'm a 19-year-old rock singer. I'm a 19-year-old sex symbol in the 60s. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm really offended. <laughs> Women used to scream my name. <laughs> they still do. <laughs> but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> now, I, let me just digress. I'm preaching in the church, in, right? I'm preaching in my church, and at the end of the service, this woman <laughs> was shouting my name, Ray, Ray, and she's waving something in the air. <laughs> and I go up to her and I said, who are you? She said, I remember you in the 60s. I've still got a piece of your shirt that I ripped off you. <laughs> <laughs> she did, and I recognized it. It was my favorite flipping shirt. It was a purple silk shirt with the pet things down there. Oh, and she started saying, I never know you were a minister, you randy little thing, she said to me. <laughs> I'm just telling you what she said. This is what happens in church in Wales. So I was a sex symbol in the 60s, all right? So, um, so I, 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 I used to see this. I used to think, yeah, but it's not, it's not for me. Just another joint, another party. And until one, one day I went to, to, a, to, a, to, a, to see a film in my village called The Greatest Story Ever Told. And the film was about the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Right there in the cinema, the Holy Spirit began to make Jesus real to me. I thank God he goes to the cinema. He will go anywhere to reach lost people. He will go anywhere. Come on, somebody. He will go anywhere to punch in the cold. And right there in the cinema, I believed. I didn't behave. I believed. I still don't behave. I'm a naughty little boy, really. So here I am. In the cinema, in the world, but connected to another one now. And my life was turned upside down. This is amazing. I'm serving Jesus. And, I, and this, is, this is incredible. The, my forerunner, and, and, and uh, I'm serving him. And, I'm, and then I sin as a Christian. I surrender against my conviction. I do something I know is wrong, but I did it. Now, the rooster was crowed for me, and I get up because of my legalistic teaching I was listening to. You're done. You've got to repent and all oh, this and that. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I tried my best. I let you down. I don't know how to make this right. I decide to walk away. I'm doing everything in my power to backslide. <laughs> and then I begin to realize that nothing can separate me from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus. Somebody better give Jesus some praise in this house right here. Now give him praise in this house right here. I'm going to pray. Have you received the word this morning? Amen. The rooster has crowed for some here. It's time to recognize it's not about you loving him. It's about him loving you. This is love, not that we love him, but that he loved us. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes right now, right across this room. And all I'm going to do, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hand back to Josh. But I want to I wanna, I wanna appeal. This message is for those that have malfunctioned as Christians. I think, wow, this was my 
Ray, I'm receiving his love. I'm receiving restoration by faith. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to say a simple prayer. If this message has related to you, one, two, three. Raise your hand up high. Hi. Jesus, you see all these hands. I don't know what you're doing personally in every life here, but I do know that from this day on, their best days are ahead of them. That potential is going to be released. They're going to serve you, not out of guilt, but out of gratitude. Father, I commend them now to your grace. And everybody said,